All viewers of Focus on Nigeria online television. Welcome to the live broadcast of the part of this television for the Alpine Ministry of Information from Cultural Affairs and Tourism, where it was a special press briefing today. And today's briefing will be jointly addressed by the Minister of Information, Honorable Jermaine Pia. And also in attendance, Patrick Rose, the executive director of the Liberia Refugee Evacuation of the Nation, and the Rose will speak on the official social commencement of AMED to me. You are most welcome to this live broadcast. My name is Gwenda Lindola, the reporter. Thank you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen of the press. I'd like to thank you for coming on this Friday. It is now our normal press conference day. This is a special one. I'd like to invite the Deputy Minister for Technical Services who will invite our guests on the platform. But before I do that, I'd just like to thank Mr. Sheikh Wajalo, the president for the Basis Association in Pinzio. When the minister told office, this big condition was bad. He had a friend who came and made contribution. And today, we have gravitated from setting to cooling. He keep and provided a water dispenser for the journalists. This morning, we have living testimony of journalists making cold water within the front room. I just like to acknowledge that because the minister has asked other friends to come to our aid in order to revamp in the reform process of the ministry. Minister Sando, National Platform. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the press. I'd like to stand on existing protocols. So on behalf of the acting leadership that was headed by Deputy Minister Johnny S. Papa, to welcome back into this historic hall, Minister General Limit, Marvin Pia the official spokesperson of the government of Liberia and Minister of Information, Cultural Affairs and Tourism, who accompanied the president on a very successful uh, visit to the People's Republic of China, where they are going to attend the, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. Our minister is back. And this edition is a special edition because a lot has been said about the FOCA, the package that was unveiled by His Excellency at the Ethel Baptist Church. The minister is here and ready to speak to you, the media, and the Liberian people, to give you further details on the package that was unveiled by the president. Also in attendance today is the education minister, Dr. Jasso, uh, Jasso Mali Jala. She has a very special message for you, the, the, the media, the Liberian people. And that's why this special edition of the press briefing was called. Without much ado, let me now seize the moment to invite to the podium the Honorable Jeremy Matthew Pia. The Minister. All
Good afternoon to all of you. Glad to see you again. After the travel, we want to give the um, space to the Minister of Education and our team. I got some very important information for you, but we thought to just uh, do some clearing house and have some conversation with you before inviting me to call. And probably we'd like to start with the President's uh, visit to Asia. The way I want to start is like this. The concept that whenever the President or an official of government travels, they are supposed to return to the country with a bag of money on their back. It's a strange phenomenon. As a country, we are a part of a global village. We have international obligations that we must own. And the only of those obligations would not necessarily mean returning the bag of money in continued truck. In the last six years or the years before, Liberia is always at the UN General Assembly. We we'll come out with bag of money. Twice a year, we are at the AU airport in Addis Ababa. Are we part with bag of money? We attend summits of ECOWAS, the MRU, etc. The Asian countries have seen the need to engage Africa. Hence, the different forums that uh, you can attend, whether in Korea, whether in Indonesia, or China. And the intent is to allow the leadership of those countries to strengthen their partnership and cooperation with the African continent. The continent that is now a major focus of many of the great nations. So we don't come here under any pressure to convince you that we'll be returning from these places with continuance of money. We we'll always try to have honest conversations about these engagements. And that's our focus. If it becomes practical where we have tangible, concrete uh, stuff that we can return with as a news, better. If not, we are not going to manufacture anything to please those who are running with the concept that every time you take a step, you should return with better money. So the president and party returned on Wednesday evening. And because those kinds of journeys are very difficult, in the wisdom of uh, some of the leaders of the church, we thought it was important to assemble at the Ephra Baptist Church for Thanksgiving and intercessory service, thanking God for the safe return of the president and his entourage. And the President used that occasion to speak directly to the nation. The President is a spokesperson in chief for his government, notwithstanding the Ministry of Information having that statutory rule. And we thought he did so very efficiently. To just further consolidate what the President said, the first there was a visit to Indonesia for the Indonesia Africa Summit, which ran from the 1st to the 3rd of September. In Indonesia, the president held a bilateral meeting with the president of Indonesia, Joko Widodo. And in that bilateral meeting, the president made a case for Indonesia to see Liberia as an attractive destination for investment. 
in the following areas. One, the expansion and value addition of oil palm production. In that regard, the President wants Indonesia to support Liberia's industrial oil production and for Indonesia to support Liberia establish an oil palm refinery where we can have the capability to produce cooking oil, margarine butter, and all the great products that the palm fruit can serve humanity. The President also made the case for Indonesia to support Liberia to industrialize and mechanize the production of rice as they are a leading rice producing country. And considering that rice is our staple, and which is also a staple for Indonesia. Indonesia has a far greater capacity and expertise to produce rice compared to Liberia. The President wants Indonesia to support and develop our own capacity to produce rice at an industrialized scale to help the country deal with full sufficiency, which is an issue that we've faced for years. He made a case for Indonesian banks to come to Liberia and invest and provide financing support for small older farmers, especially those in the oil palm sector. Golden Beryllium, which currently operates in the southeast of the country, is an Indonesian company. And at the moment, has rolled out about 2.2 billion in investment in the oil palm sector. President Waka acknowledged Indonesia is Indonesian counterpart. The investment in gold in Beryllium should be expanded. And it's counting on Indonesia as a major investment platform to expand economic activities in the Southeast. Other areas where Indonesia and Liberia will forge cooperation are energy and petroleum, educational exchange and scientific research. The President calls for the reactivation of the Indonesia Liberia Joint Commission. And the Joint Commission will serve as the platform for the development cooperation between the both countries. Let the President head to China, the People's Republic of China. There, we participated in the FOCAL meeting. And basically, this was one of the most successful because all of the 54 countries in Africa were represented. Uh, with, I think three or four, I don't know, the vice president or someone else, but the rest of them, over 50, were represented by the presidents. At the end of that focus summit, we were privileged to hold special bilateral meeting with the president of uh, China. It is important to note that all the 50 plus leaders that went there, and I show what well, 20 of them had a chance to have a larger with the president of China. But because our representation was focused, because the president knew exactly what he wanted, we showed that we were able to have a bilateral with the Chinese president. President Buaka and the Chinese leader immediately reactivated the previously store overhead bridge project <coughs> at the ministerial complex in the SKD Boulevard. On Monday, we have a huge media engagement where the public were doing the National Investment Commission uh, and a group of other people being involved to dig deeper into it. But what I would say if you remember the overhead bridge that was built around LU, that was just used or put across over to the other side, if that is your interpretation of what we're talking about, then you get me wrong. What we're talking about is an interchange. Meaning, vehicles, it's almost like a roundabout of vehicles with drive on it, not something for people to get climb and cross on the other side. That's why the cost implication is approximately 30 million US dollars. If it's trans transformed whatever money they have there into US dollars, it will cost around 30 million. So it's no small product. It is something that will transform the 
the block of our city, particularly on that belt, and around the ministerial complex where you have several government ministries converging to do their work. And the critical area you see at the SKD Boulevard, the two interchanges will be built there. It will cost approximately 30 million USD. Very important for our country. Let me also state that this project was basically re deactivated. There's a lot of new projects that say it's been long in the work, it started with the Ellen Johnson administration. It was, it was secured from being put aside, and probably should have been executed over the last six years. But we are all aware, no secret, that something took place that stained the bilateral relationship between China and Liberia. What President Walker's government has been able to do is that we'll just eight months in office, been able to turn that situation around, reactivated the availability of the fund, and the project is expected to start uh, in the first quarter of next year, specifically in February. And when that starts in a couple of months, we're going to see something new in our city, that should make all of us happy. China also announced uh, a grant aid of 200 million RMB, which is their money, to Liberia, 30 million RMB for food assistance. And because we defaulted on our loan for the airport, we incurred penalty. As a result of that engagement, the penalty, which is around 6.6 .6 million, RMB was waived. Now mind you, if you incur penalties that you cannot meet, it will not mind your capacity and ability to be qualified for borrowing. What I would have done, I would have stored every possibility of getting additional resources from China. And knowing the constraints that we are faced with, and after President Walker had effectively made a case, the Chinese agreed and the way that amount, which opened the space for the kind of financial engagement we must have with them. That default was not done by the current administration. The default was done by the administration of the past, and that's one of the essences of the past that we've been able to solve in just seven months. Additional 30 million RMB will be used for agricultural equipment to advance our arrest agenda. And the commitment that was made by ELBS, remember I signed the agreement to rehabilitate the facilities there at the cost of around 5.5 million. The additional commitments were made in the tomb of 185 million RMB. I'm told if you make the conversion, it will be around 26 million. And the intent of that will be to expand the operation of ELBC to the entire country where we can have access to radio and television coverage. In addition to these specific and direct commitments from the Chinese government, we have space where many multi-million dollar Chinese companies who interact with different African leaders that were emerging. Now remember the Chinese committed that in the next three years, it was spent 50.7 billion on Africa. Part of the way they spend those money because of the way the country goes <coughs> is that they empower their companies. Because when they do so, it, pro it provides jobs for the citizens, it keep the companies themselves operational, it allows them to be able to engage the entire continent. So much of the amounts you heard about in the 50.7 billion, Chinese company will bid for some of those amounts to strengthen their operations in Africa. So what do we do as a government? We research and pay attention to some of the companies that should be benefiting. We had conversations, and as a result of those conversations, we signed a number of MOUs with some of the companies. Now remember, MOUs are not agreements. They basically put up an aspiration or an intent of what should be done. 
So if some of you are so concerned as to why we're not lifting the MOUs that we're doing, the concrete and grievance that I just listed, it's because it, we're just aspiring to something. For example, we heard that you all heard about, and I know there were a lot of noise because there are just some who believe that nothing positive should happen. Some of the years something that sound positive, they're trembling and they get vexed. It's like, I'm not there, so nothing is supposed to happen. So a number of MOUs were signed, including one signed by me. And the intent of that MOU is for the company to be able to invest in an area that is in, of interest to us as far as tourism and hospitality is concerned. They want to build hotels. They want to build real estate structure, North grade apartments, which will help to settle some of our housing problems. We have more engagements to do so that we can transmit that from the MOU to an agreement. And the estimated cost that they have with no obligation to Liberia. The MOU itself is non binding But all that is required to ensure the full implementation of that concept, if it is transmitted into an agreement, will be approximately 20 million USD. The company that is supposed to uh, construct the, the refinery in, in, in Grand Basel, again, it's a concept. But these are companies that are very linked to the Chinese administration. They trust their own ability to compete for a portion of those uh, 50.7 billion to be able to advance their investment activities in Africa. And they sincerely want to come and do just that. And the estimated cost for that will be around 3 billion as you heard. In fact, just before this press conference, the team have reached out to the NIC. They already uh, dispatching a delegation that should be in Monrovia to hold conversation uh, on how to make progress. The delegation will be here shortly. The NRC is prepared to receive them. And this tells you the seriousness that the very companies themselves attached to the very MOU the sign. One other major agreement that I have been spoken about very much in the agreement signed by the Liberia Maritime Authority. Ships moving into China that will carry the Liberian flag, we lost more than 300 of them. And what that means is revenue. That is because there were huge cost implications for their movement to China. And I think Singapore or so got a special agreement with China where all those cost implications were removed. As a result, many of these ships dashed our flag and decided to carry a flag of Singapore. So what did NATO and his team do? They engaged the Chinese authority in the region of understanding to remove all those photos that made those ships to be putting our flag aside and carrying another country's flag. And as we speak, because they were comfortable with Liberia, Liberia maritime program has been very expansive because the ships in the maritime sector feel very comfortable flying our flag. And as a result of that agreement, that one is not an MOU, it's a concrete solid agreement. You folks started coming right back. And what that means is viability for the maritime program. What that also means is additional resources for the country through the maritime program. So all these different tangible uh, stuff took place in China. And as a government, we are happy. If there are others, Liberian or whoever, they believe you are not happy with the year of progress and they want to turn everything into political debate and discourse, it's fair enough. That's what the democratic state does. But trust me, why are you very busy engaging with all your political stuff to making progress? That's why it's important to us. We are making progress. And the fruit of everything that we're doing, as I always say at this press conference, you can calculate it, you can grade us, you can make a determination as to what we did, what we did not do when the mandate that was given to President Walker, which is a six year period ends. In the middle of the game, you cannot argue that the game has been lost or the game has been won. So we're keeping our focus on the prize and we'll continue to do everything we 
supposed to do. If you follow the engagement in China, you didn't go to play. When the investment forum was held in Shenzhen, I brought together dozens of Chinese businesses. Those of you who were able to follow, I know it was late. But you saw how that engagement was. Different presentations from the government actors were made, including one for myself, on the IRS agenda. Trying to find the buy-in of those business people, those investors, into what we intend to do with the next six years using the IRS agenda as the basis. And we can tell you that based on the things we presented, the Chinese are deeply interested in our country. Not for the wrong reasons, but to assist us, advance economic activities, bring in more investors, help to make the economy work, and create jobs for the people. Because they need jobs. So the China mission, the Indonesia mission, all very great. And what I could say as a spokesperson of the government is that the mission to Asia was a resounding success. There is an issue that emerged while I was out of the country that concerns uh, my ministry, which I want to talk about. The CSA has been doing a great job. And we know that government entities, government ministries and agencies were overflowed. Sometimes you cannot measure what that overflowing is doing to impact the positive uh, work being done by the entities. So the CSA have been doing so across different ministries and agencies. And they submitted a funding in my absence. And all the media people from everywhere were still managing to get to me through what up while I was away. And what I said to them was this. Yes, there's a team in charge. I've asked that team to hold on to whatever the CSA report is. And at the head of the entity, we'll get back and do a review. And I want to first thank all the employees in the different categories for maintaining the calm. Because what most people know how to do is to be all more involved. But the individuals from Mika who were captured in the different categories, they've been responsible enough to hold their peace until we return. But while we do all the necessary consultation as a ministry, and eventually have a sit down with the CSA to find a way forward, what I could say from the initial is that some of the things that were reported are alarming. But as alarming as they are, we will not take a lead jet approach to how we handle that. We'll be more engaging, we'll talk to the different categories of people, and in the end, a determination will be made. But in my opinion, the reports suggest that about 98 persons, based on the funding of the CSA, should be dismissed. If you just look at some of the details, you will get concerned, but like I said, as a ministry, especially a ministry of leaders who are focused on knowing how to do the right thing, we do all of the engagements before we derive an action. But just imagine this. Some of the things they reflected. You work for a ministry, and the report says in just one period, short period, like a whole year, you have an unexcused absence of 60 days. And the CSA own law is very clear, the standing order says 14 consecutive days of an excuse is granted for this person. So you might have 60 days, uh, 68 days, some of the figures that I'm looking at here, uh, 65 days, 52 days, 55 days, 54 days, Concerning. Uh, in the CSA is thinking, they said there's business people. We want to be more engaging before we can reach any conclusion. Uh, we have to consider that all of the individuals who work with different entities are wanting first. They are Liberians. So we've got to figure out together as a team, including the CSA, follow our analysis on these issues. 
before we can move forward. And we want to remain, we call on the employees involved to remain calm as they've been, as we get engaged with each other to see where we go from here. They have another listing of some um, Eight persons who are in some serial default as well, but the say for these people want them. My only initial observation is that some of these people in the one category, I mean, category were as absent as up to 50 days as well. So, what qualified the other 50 day men for this message and what puts this other person in the space for money? So, we're going to look at all of that. And then there's another category calling for suspensions. Um, this one is not a number, but as I look at it, it's probably up to 100 or more that they say we should suspend. And the last category is a group of persons that say we should motivate. I don't know what that means. Uh, so these are the reasons for the engagement I'm talking about. They are around 79. And on this list, we put some of the most hardworking individuals that I know of in this ministry. If I'm going to be here, I don't know if I'm going to be here. I got that Thompson, who's doing well in the Communication Bureau. Uh, Joseph Charlie runs the New Liberia newspaper. Some people whose visibility and work outcome we can see and experience are on these areas. So a determination has to be made on what that motivation means. But the point we wanted to make is that this has been in the works for a good while. We now have the, the report. Uh, I will work with the team. We will <coughs> scrupulously evaluate and analyze the report. Uh, whatever concerns and recommendations we have will be noted, and then we'll do further engagement from the CSK, and in the end, we will find a closure to this matter. But it's important when you have a piece of job to do, pay attention to the job. Because it's just unfair if another group of persons come to work every day, and you just sit to your house for 70 days, for 80 days, and because we pay people through the bank and never deposit, you're enjoying the fact that your money just rolling in your car and you're eating and you're not working. So we'll figure out. And I, I am hopeful that we'll find a very amicable solution to these things. But it is possible, one thing I can say is that if somebody has not been working before, in the past, on a different leadership. And you have to work on the leadership that I have with all these wonderful people. You will work. You will know that you're supposed to work, then you will work. But like I said, we, we, we engage for them, and in the end, we'll transport to the time. So these are just a few clearing us issues that we'll have to touch. A lot is happening, but we can't say everything today because we'll have to honor the intention of the Minister of Education and our team to come and speak to the great people through Mika. So, Madam Minister. All right, so the point of order for the very good and very helpful. And so, of course, your parents. And all the number of ministers. Agenda has 
put forward in terms of its commitment to strengthening and improving educational outcomes, to diversifying and promoting TVET education, and strengthening our governance systems. We have embarked on some activities in that regard. So I've come with my team today to share with the librarian people what we have done. Several things we're going to be reporting on today is the completion of our volunteer teacher profiling. And we'll have someone come up to share more details on that process. That process has uh, concluded and we have been able to profile through that process over 6,000 volunteer teachers in our system with 1,000 uh, some more being noted as female and over 5,000 um, males. Also, we're going to be sharing information on our EO education officer vetting process. Uh, we know we took over a system, again, that is severely challenged with uh, the right people in the right places doing the right things. While folks are in positions, as uh, Mr. Pia said, I want to thank him for this opportunity for coming on an unusual day. Uh, so we appreciate the opportunity to speak to the librarian people. But as he was indicating, as we look to improve our processes and add digital technology for the ease of doing business, we also see that that has created another problem. The problem with integrity, with people taking salaries and not doing the jobs that they are paid to do. And then you have volunteers in the system who have been given, lending their time, whether one might say they're qualified or not, but they have not been compensated. So we've embarked on not only profiling the volunteer teachers, but knowing who they are, where they are, what subjects they are teaching, what counties they are in, what schools they are operating out of, and what levels they are um, employed in, not employed in that, that they are serving in. And then we embarked, as I said, on the vetting process. Uh, the statutorily, the ministry is supposed to set standards and regulations for competitive recruitment. Um, and we saw when we took over, no indication of that process. Uh, so we embarked on uh, a, a vetting process to ensure that we have qualified people in uh, the position for leading our education delivery service. People who have studied and acquired um, credentials in education, who were educators by their training. So we'll have um, Dr. Cassell, who will speak to that um, process. That process also has concluded. It is important that we inform the public on that process um, so that you, uh, you know, do away with misinformation. The person that's going to speak on the teacher profiling, the volunteer teacher profiling, is Mr. Mani Fumblet. He's concluded that process. And also, we'll give you some uh, preliminary information as we prepare for our national school census. The last school census that was done um, for uh, the sector was is two years old. And it's about time um, that we engage in another school census. So we'll be giving you some information on that process and when we plan to commence. So I will turn over now to uh, Dr. Cassell. Uh, there's some members of the team here with her uh, that served on that panel. 
uh, that would quickly introduce themselves as she uh, take the, the podium to give us uh, the report on the EO vetting process. Dr. Cassell. My name is Mr. Joe Arvidi Tom, the board chair for marketing and the chairman of all counties school board. I serve as a co-chairman for the betting committee. Thank you so much. My name is Dr. Benjamin Wei. I am the president of the National Principal Association of Nigeria and the Lacoste's College of Education. I'm a member of the committee. National Principal Association. I'm Eva Prince Moake, executive director for the Center of Excellence for Teacher Licensing and School Accreditation and coordinator of the federal committee. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Madam Minister and the Minister of Education team, I want to say thanks for the opportunity. This is indeed a new day in Liberia. I said to you, I'm the president for the Professional Educator Association. We educators, we are now trying to tell Liberians who don't know that education is a profession. You are, like I said in Ganta last week, you are educated, but you are not an educator. Many, let me put in the library where you know book, but you don't know how to teach people to know book. So those who know how to teach people to know book, let them take what it is, you're teaching people to know book. This is where we are today. Um, so I'm very glad that uh, the ministry could ask the chair for the professional, the president for the professional association to lead the process. We have been in this thing and we know it. This profession has been considered as walk in and walk out. It's time that those who want to just walk in and walk out, go and walk around the sidewalk and those who know what to do take all. So the Minister of Education has done it all. <coughs> so thank you to you and your team. We are getting somewhere. <coughs> okay, um, they put a team together, independent team together, because I said from the university, he said he from La Cose. So it means that the Minister of Education was out. Yes, they have people have been coming around, but they were out, they gave us the chance to do what they wanted us to do and gave them the result. We received um, 412 applications from the Ministry of Education. Education has a law that we call the Education Act of 2011. The team used that law to vet education officers, both D and C. Before we met, before we could touch any paper, I would go the simplest way because I'm a teacher, I like to teach, and people won't ask me the questions. So I like to explain, explain good. So you ask, just ask me a few. Before we could even touch any application, we had a meeting that the law is saying, to be 
education officer, you must have a master degree in education with two years of experience in the classroom or in the school. Or bachelor with five years. So we agree that's the law. We must go by the law. Then we decided that whatever we do here, we stay here because we know myself and Gaba ain't outside there, and my uncle outside there, so that so we should be in here. Whatever we do here, should stay right here until we get ten forward to the ministry. We sign consent forms. The forms are there if they want the ministry to turn it over to the press to see what we did. The team came from that voice background. We had those with the education, civil society were represented. We had people, um, religious leaders, they were all in the team for us to do this work. So we received 412 applications from the Ministry of Education. The first step was to sort out the documents because people who didn't do education, they have applied. Those who did education also apply, so we have to put them into separate categories. Those who did education on one side, those who did do education, we we'll put them on the other side. So for the CEOs, we had a total of 57 persons who did education, and we're looking for 16. We have 15 counties, but according to the education ministry, they divided most of rather into two because of the number of schools. So um, the education ministry has 16 county education officers. And then we have um, 300 plus for the position of district education officer. Of that number, 227 were qualified to past the first stage. The first stage is to look at the credential to know whether you did education. If you didn't, we'll pull you aside. Let me make something clear here because I continue to get quick calls by the minister and I'm being attacked for some, by some of my professional colleagues. There is no degree called Kennedy. There, I, I went to school but I've not heard any degree called Kennedy. Either you have a student or something. There is no degree called Kennedy. So there were some who applied and said, oh, but well, I'm currently in a master program. That's not a degree. Yes. There were others who said, um, but I defended my thesis already. That's not a degree. There were others who said, I did my corrections already. That is not a degree. Master did master, I did doctorate. You can defend your thesis and fail. You can make corrections and fail. So, we wanted the document. We also did not take letter attestation from anywhere <laughs> because we got white trade center, you could go there and get letter attestation. So we wanted the paper. From there, we were able to sort the documents out and get the number of people that we had. Those that crossed the first stage, meaning they had the credential that we needed, we went to the second stage. That stage, we had written tests, we had interview, and we did something just email. So for the written test, they were all working, the DOs were working for 80 points. Why not 100? We the background check. We wanted 100 percent background check, but uh, we could not get all. So we decided to do away with that for now. The Ministry of Education can continue with that. You know, every if you are qualified and for some reason, you know, um, they find us something they can use that in their own. So they don't do that. Except for one person who applied and we got written document that that person did something to a female student. That one you have completely. Yes, yeah, so. For the egos, they sat the rating test. Um, from that number, we have people, ladies and gentlemen, 
score is zero on the rating test. Some cases, yeah, as low as zero. We have some people scoring nine. And these are people who are supposed to be supervising our principals, supervising our teachers. And if they can give you just a short test to maybe tell me about yourself why you think this thing is you want to be DEO, and you don't know why you want to be DEO. We, we had a phone by our minister when somebody wrote as a disappointed um, DEO, instead of newly disappointed DEO, instead of saying newly appointed DEO. <laughs> you know. So the hard that it was. So as we went through the process, they went through the writing, they went through the interview, and for the computer, we had the we had the, the rubric, we had something there. The laptop is set. The instruction is if you don't have email address already, use the email address on the paper, send a communication if you are a CEO, invite your district education officer to communicate. And you send it. It's already there. For the DOs, we did the same thing, but they were to invite the principals to a meeting. And with that, um, as I said, people spoke as low as zero, nine, 13, and that we really wanted to project so that he would ask for something to say, well, late, we should have done, said that earlier, so we can't really put it on the street. But uh, the ministry will have the report, and then you can get it. So from there, we were able to come out, we have now the 16 CEOs who presented the names of the ministry, but there were some who did very well. Very, very well. There were some who did well. Let me take it excellent, very good, good, fair, and poor. Mm. Mm? So there were some who did excellent, there were some who did very good, good, fair. So we went for excellent, we went for good, very good, we went for good. And we were able to get the 16 county education officers, 100, 124 district education officers. We'll turn the names for the ministry. If you want more information, the ministry will provide information to you. <coughs> So I, I think I stop here. I want, if you have any question for the team, we are willing to answer um, because I've been running to a lot of people right after here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Cassell. Um, if you would, if you can, please highlight for the public the issue around the gender balance okay. through the competitive process, because that's critical to the nation that um, you know they know uh, gender parity um, in the process. Okay. Um, when she is finished with that, those of you who have questions, ask her because she got us in here. So just just line yourself and get like it's finishing. Okay, for so the county education officers. When we went to the process, we had all male, no female. But there is something called affirmative action. Mm. Yes. So we went to the list of district education officers who had the requisite qualification, the experience, and everything. Yes, they applied to be district education officers, but they were also qualified to move on to the level of CEO. So uh, two persons were dropped from the CEO for, um, I gave one example. One of them is my incoming faculty. I gave him a scholarship to go do masters and come and help me at the University of Nigeria. Um, he only shared for the coming semester, but he applied. Then I sit there as the chair and allow him to go. No. 
So I use his contract that my signature is on, his signature is on it, the former minister signature is on it, the World Bank representative signature is on it. And then the schedule to disqualify him not for not going as CEO. So we took a lady from the DO list who met the threshold and made her CEO. There was another candidate who had a problem as CEO. So we put, um, took another lady and we put them. So we did that to have three female CEOs and then 13 DO officers. Um, 13, yeah, 13 and 3. Um, the all CEOs apply. The all 16 CEOs apply. Of the all CEOs, only three, only three were qualified or are qualified to come back to serve as CEOs. The rest of the CEOs, income CEOs, are new. So, um, Madam Minister, as we said before we started this, Professional Educator Association is Washington Ministry of Kingdom. And I want to press to carry this and carry this all the way. We have done this work. We are trying to make this a profession. So if um, that the Kassel name is on that list, and what for whatever reason you drop her name and put that protection child, people who you responsible, we are going to get our initial education. It's time that those who did you I, I tell people I'm, I'm called Dr. Cassell, but you can't send me to the hospital and kill. When I see the patient checking, I want the checking to stop. I will give you the first or the second one. When you can't stop, I gave you another one. I give it to you. I give it to you. I want it to stop. Because that's not my error. So those who did education they will understand the language. There are techniques, there are words that you use. Do they know how to push people when they have we are not looking for police officers in the schools. We are looking for people who will mentor our teachers and push them where they have gaps. So let the right people take the position and move on. We have been in the dark too long. So we are working with the Ministry of Education to ensure that these things, the people are called. So if you have any relative for some reason you want to call somebody there, just say the Professional Education Association will come after you. Thank you. Do you have any other question? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Marcel, for your evaluation. My question is uh, basically about maybe those who, uh, who participated in the class as well, they were not successful. Anyway, what's your maybe what's your encouragement to them? Because they might see uh, they are they are they are feeling um, maybe something like that will demotivate them. So maybe pass a word of encouragement to them. Uh, maybe feeling this one is not the end of life. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the Ministry of Education, we, as I said earlier, the Ministry of Education. 16 of the all 16 CEOs apply. They are already employed for the Ministry of Education. So the Ministry they live there along the way. What they did, they asked us to vet those people so they can assign them in other areas in the ministry. They are not going to cite them, but they are going to find areas for them. But don't go in the classroom. Don't be an education officer. If you did criminal justice, Maybe you need some, you can serve as legal, the legal, work with the legal team, the Ministry of Education. If you did uh, sociology, you can stay somewhere else, but not a supervisor, because you don't know what to do for when you get on the feet. Thank you. Any other? Yeah, so my name is James M. Pala. One second. If you have a pen and paper, you have to take a note. Then I just ask you to ask about that question. My name is James M. Bala, and I report for Rio Jordan regarding my Kibbe County. I, Madam President, thank you for the virtual process and thank you for the actions you are taking, especially when you say that you do education, you don't want to have the face of education. 
you can carry on the operating process across the country, you can come up with your people you want to be. Um, with this thing actually be applied with those who are in the field as teachers, because we have found out that people are teaching and they are also being displaced and doing from different fields of actions and in your classroom. Thank you. I think there's a question for me, and I'm going to jump into Porsche. And says, um, this, is a, this is a phased approach, and so your question is, is poignant. We are going to move not only with the teachers, but also the administrators at the school level. Principals, vice principal of instruction, administration, and registrars. So this is a swooping reform process that we've embarked on, but we have to start with the leadership as we move down to the school level operations. Thank you, Manisa. Okay, so thank you, Manisa, Simon, and I go to Scarlett. Uh, thank you, Minister, for the prizes. But you are then given six year mandate, you know, to govern the sector. You are carrying on with um, this process. What is the mechanism put in place to guard the good work done by these people? Thank you. Uh, Talking me. about this point, the speaker. No, the main speaker. No. no. Any points which you write down? Points for me, I'm asking the minister. I'm asking the minister. Excuse me. She's going somewhere, and that's why we said you take off. The minister is still here. You don't have to run. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kunia Felix. I'm only for that. I said, Can you talk about people scoring zero, nine, ten percent? We will not be prepared to have this entire report. Of, can you tell the categories of persons that pass with excellent, good, and very good? Thank you. Well, that is why I said um, I wanted to protect because I have everything. But I keep on fucking the deal. We can protect now because of this. But we'll turn it over to the ministry and then I keep on putting the paper or whatever we do. But we keep, I keep on actually to show it on something so you can see. Yeah. The last one, sir. Thank you, Dad. My name, my name is Trogon Farmer, and I report for Sport FM and Sport TV. For your concern, um, people would like to know how long some, some of those people have been serving that position before the administration of the test. Because maybe all the period, the, 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 the test they've been doing, but that may be quite different from why you why you why you came. So people would like to know, you know, how long some of those people did they provide any record, you know, of how long they've been serving in those positions. Well, the minister will add to that, yes, because we had some people say for five years, six years, you know, they've been serving with some one, you know, some two. So we can't give you it as it is. So if you want a full detail, you can get it. But everybody, everybody tests. Um, education, I would say we want people who do education. We have special people who do our tests. Yeah. That is why when you have testing center, you should look for an educator. Because they got, they call, they got a standard test. They can teach on main tests. So you have teachers joining tests. So, yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cassell. So now I will have, um, we will have Mr. Fongle who will give us the information on the volunteer teacher profiling. We know that this has been one of the challenges in our system um, to handle once and for all uh, this volunteer teacher issue. Uh, but you can't address an issue that you're not fully informed about. So to be fully informed, we had to complete a profiling process. And after this profiling process, the next activity will be now the assessment of these people that have been profiled. So, and, and then the next is now the ones that are assessed and 
have the teachable skills or have the requisite skills to remain in the classroom but need some refresher, we will make sure that they get that refresher. The ones that are misfit, we will make sure that we find, um, you know, encourage them to do something else and, and open up other avenues for employability for them. Thank you. Um, the public? All right. Well, thank you, Madam Minister. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to proceed on our existing protocols. Well, as part of the Minister's reform at the Ministry of Education to improve learning outcomes, she decided to carry on a process of profiling all voluntary teachers in the country. Basically, that was intended to have the right teacher place in the right school at the right time. And based on our manpower planning process, we carry on an exercise that, that was done simultaneously across the counties, for which we're able to verify successfully 6,192 teachers across the county. And uh, amongst them, we were able to capture male and female, I will provide that data, the total amount of female teachers that have been registered, from 1,186 persons, and the total amount of male in the process, about 5,006 male voluntary teachers. In, in addition to the process I'll carry out, there were three few requirements and, and uh, credentials that are being considered. She just didn't want teachers in the classroom. I think we just listened to Dr. Cassell. She spoke, she, she, she just spoke uh, clearly about the vetting process that was done for the CEOs and DEOs. And so in the wisdom of the minister, she wanted an independent process. And so having contacted us at the time, we went ahead, had a set of requirements that those teachers had to provide before being profiled. First, they had to come in with their credentials. As a teacher, you have a credential to what you have a BSc, you, or you have a teacher's certificate, and you have to provide an attestation letter. And of course, you have to capture the metadata, your name, your age, your gender, because this is the first time where the minister can sit on her tablet in her office and see exactly the amount employment records and credentials of all the teachers across the country. And so that's a summary analysis. Having done, done our profile for a month, we, we've uh, submitted the report. And so in the wisdom of the minister, on August 9th, the president launched uh, a national enrollment drive. And so the minister has been very much concerned about that and said, in furtherance of that enrollment drive, what the president intends and how they interested in, in seeing all school going kids in school, she's, she's considering to launch a national student identification system where every school going child, every, prof every professional student in the country will be issued a unique identification. For instance, when you go to college as a freshman, you have been issued an ID number during your first year, and that ID number stays with you in college for sophomore, junior, and senior. Likewise, this is what is done in developing countries. And so the minister in a wisdom is concerned that for nursery, from first grade, from 12th grade, those in colleges will be assigned a unique ID number that all persons, all child going to school will be able to use during an education sojourn. And that is intended to attract students across the country. And so she spoke about that because there are issues where people are performing in one school, they fail in a class, they migrate to the next school, and then they go to water center and try to change their grade sheets. And because of technology, if we are asked to verify a person in this room, we, are, we only need to go to Facebook, log your name, and see your profile. So that unique ID number that will be assigned to every student any school you go to, your information will always will always be ahead and be waiting for you. So you're going to call on on that group, on that um, portion of fraud. And then the next thing is issue of data. 
The school year has just opened. And basically the donors are very much interested in the educational data. And so as you already said, the school census will soon be ongoing. Is uh is uh concluding the planning stages already. But you're highly interested in having empirical data of all the students in the schools. She want to sit on her laptop in her office or where any education stakeholders can see exactly the amount of students per county, per district, per school, per gender, and have the information in real time for decision making purposes. So having said that, that will complete at this point. Um, around the volunteer teachers um, profiling, we had teams distributed in all the counties uh, that undertook this process, and no one was turned away in terms of uh, participating in the process. The data was collected um, and validated and was reposited in a system, in a digitized system, including photos along with credentials and biodata. So we have that now at the ministry. And what we're looking at is really stressing the need to have quality data. Because having quality data will inform us on not only planning properly, but in preparing to instruct properly. So in addition to this activity is the um, educational strengthening uh, um, system, the MS Data. ESA uh, is a project funded by USAID to help us with the collection of data at the school level, district and county level. And all of this would feed into one system so that we have quality data of who's in our schools, whether it's teachers, it's support staff, or uh, administrators. <coughs> so data um, collection is going to be really key Hence why the school census uh, tool that we're using was retooled, and uh, Mr. Parker now will come and talk about uh, the school census uh, preparation, what we have done there, the expectations in the next few weeks that will um, uh, begin to, to, to get done this exercise. Good afternoon. I'm Honorable Thomas M. Barton, Assistant Minister of Planning Research and Development of the University of Education. And as an Assistant Minister who leads on this, we will be able to provide a few details on how the census is going to look like. The under school census is a major priority of the Minister of Education. And what makes it a major priority? It will give us few details of what the system looks like. The census will not only focus on enrollment, but it will focus on infrastructure, the teacher's qualification, curriculum, and everything that entails in the system. The exercise will be done from October 28 to November 22. This year's census will include the TVEC component. The last census conducted did not take into consideration the technical information and education. And this is what the Minister of Youth Exposed and MOE have worked on. And we have included it in the tools that will be used when the conduct of the census. This year's census, we decided to introduce the school based census. The school based census will be conducted by the school administrator. We are moving towards the full ownership. We want to see at what level can the school administrators conduct the census by themselves. So school administrators will be trained and be followed with the conduct of the census. If the results of the school-based census prove positive, then of course the minister will have time to make a decision in rolling up the rest of the counties. For this year, pilots will be Mosserado 1 and 2, River Sash, River G, and Bakul. We want to pilot the school-based census into these counties. And we hope that the results can give us the result that we want. But if you prove that they can do it, then of course we'll move it to the other county that we just mentioned. 
the, the data are going to be real time. It's going to be evident based. The reason is that the data will help the Minister of Education to see how they can shift, how we can shift the direction of the education system going to go for the next academic year. In terms of support, we will mention the USA, ESA, the UNICEF, and the European Union. The contract of the census will take will be about $1.2 million. About $1.2 million. It is somewhat the same, but the amount is huge. But this amount will account for training, account for training, account for logistics, equipment for the conduct of the census. We say real time. So the $1.2 million that you heard about will account for all the things that will help us make sure that the census is effective and they give us the result of actually one that we can put the government before. Again, we want to call on the public, school administrators, the parents, to support us in the conduct of the census. Like Ella said, the census will inform us how, where can we shape the education system where necessary. Thank you. Okay, so thank you uh, to all the presenters. That concludes the updates that we wanted to provide uh, the librarian people. And if we have questions now, we can take those questions. So, while the minister was in flight, we witnessed the arrival of the executive director of the LCCC, Mr. Wozi. He's here to provide an update, so we'll take his update, I, and then we'll take the questions together. Mr. Wuzi. Show that the mandate is carried out. 
requires some level of advocacy and opinion at different levels. But what was the experiment made to bring back our people from Ghana? Who had thousands of Liberians living in the Bujukuraka after three decades in school buildings in the streets? Didn't it happen? So our task was to bring them back home. Two separate dates. The first batch arrived in June, late June, and the second came in the uh, one of August. The first batch was 770 persons, and the second batch of whole body was 769. When you do the math, you have about 1,539. We had a task to make sure that we bring them based on the national standard. On a mass migration and migration law, the rule says that there are standards, international standards must apply. They be taking the lead to bring back people on a voluntary repatriation. If you make the steps, it can be taken down and lead to our human reparations. With the support of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, our local leader, the Minister of Internal Affairs, have our board chairman and all those who work along with us. With the support of the Big Up family, we also to salute you. Thank you very much for sending your team in the EIBC to help us. We are happy to tell our grand people today that the task given to us is about to end. We'll be coming back and forward informing you on the updates. And we have been paying our people, we had a large batch of people to pay close to 400. And since the now outstanding families, there have been demonstrations that have been always around to understand the frustration and the concerns of our brothers and sisters coming back home. But as a government, we are responsible people. We believe that the task given to us can be managed and handled with quite a lot of patience. We have to have ranking priorities. So we've been knocking on the doors of our brothers. We took you from Asia, we brought you home. Please be patient with us. The good news here is that the government will to source the funding with the blessing of the advocates and the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, our board members, or the fully library people will not have the funding available to pay the life back to people 469. I want to say a big thank you to the Minister of Finance and all those who have been able to ensure that what was made available to commence the process. As we speak right now,